Well, I'm very excited to be with you today to do this webinar um, to give you an update on the CLSA. And um, I'm very pleased to present it on behalf of Parminder Reyna and Christina Wilson and the entire uh, CLSA research team. It's a really exciting moment for us at this particular time. Well, to be honest, it's another exciting moment for us at the CLSA. There's never a dull moment at the CLSA. Um, but it's a really important time in our history as we release for use um, the, the baseline data um, on all 50,000 plus participants um, for use by the research community. So the focus of my presentation today, as you can see, is really about the practical. It's really going to um, uh, focus on how to use the data and how to apply for the data. And I hope it will be useful to you. I will, and I apologize in advance, um, go over some of the, the baseline information and um, the study design and content. I think it's essential to do that just to orient everyone, but I know there's lots of people on the call who've heard this before. Um, I'll try and go over it fairly briefly and then get into uh, the really exciting stuff, which is how to access the data. So as you know, the, C the CLSA is a strategic initiative of CIHR. And at its inception, when we were developing the study, there were more than 160 researchers and collaborators from 26 institutions. That number has increased dramatically now. Uh, but when we were very first designing it, that was uh, the complement that was involved. It is highly multidisciplinary, and we would go so far as to say interdisciplinary and hopefully even transdisciplinary, um, and involves elements from biology, genetics, medicine, economics, epidemiology, the whole gamut of um, disciplines that have an impact on aging. And it really is uh, the largest research platform of its kind in Canada, given its depth and breadth. To remind you of the study design, um, we initially planned to recruit 50,000 men and women who were 45 to 85 who were living in the community. Um, and those people were followed in two ways. 20,000 were randomly selected from the 10 provinces and they were followed by telephone and completed a questionnaire. Another 30,000 were randomly selected from within 25 to 50 kilometers of 11 sites in seven provinces across the country. And those people uh, were followed both in their home uh, and they came to a data collection site where they provided physical assessments and also blood and urine. The design is to follow participants for 20 years. We do a full follow-up every three years, and we do a maintaining contact in between. At the baseline, uh, we actually went back to participants at 18 months and collected data from them. Uh, we have now changed that so that in the second wave, or sorry, in the first follow-up, uh, we will collect all of the information uh, when we go back to them at once. Um, and then the intent is to link to numerous administrative databases over time. This just gives you an idea of where we are now. So you can see that the baseline data collection was finished in 2015, and we're midway through the first follow-up at this point in time. With respect to recruitment, and I put this slide in here because I think it's very important, um, one of the things that is somewhat unique to the CLSA is that people were randomly selected to participate. So we use three uh, separate sampling frames, but all of them can be rolled up. We partnered with Statistics Canada initially and recruited people through the CCHS uh, Survey on Healthy Aging. We also partnered with Provincial Ministries of Health and uh, used, utilized the health card registration databases uh, and recruited participants that way. And then we supplemented that with random digit dialing. What this led to is um, a study that is both 
national in scope and has a representative sampling frame. And if you look at all the blue dots, that just indicates that people were randomly selected from uh, each of those provinces to participate in telephone interviews. And you can see in red the data collection sites where people participated in home interviews uh, and came to a data collection visit. Another thing about the CLSA that makes it quite innovative and uh, also very unique is that it's completely, uh, the data is completely captured electronically. So participants provide questionnaire data <coughs> once they're recruited into the CLSA and whether it's done by telephone or whether it's done by home interview, it all gets stored at the Statistical Analysis Center. You can see also that there is a data collection site visit and there's a lot of processing that occurs in terms of those physical assessments and also in terms of the biological data that's collected. The biological data, the blood and urine is stored at the Biorepository and Bioanalysis Center at McMaster. Uh, eventually, all of that data will become alphanumeric once it is analyzed. Some of it may actually never be alphanumeric, but the, what will become alphanumeric then goes to the Statistical Analysis Center and that's where the data gets disseminated to researchers. Uh, I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on this later in the presentation, but just to give you an idea of the depth and breadth of the information that's collected in the CLSA, you can see that there's a wide range of questionnaire modules. Things ranging from education to to vision, to cognitive status, to depression, to satisfaction with life, caregiving, retirement planning. Um, and also, too, you can see that we have a veteran identifier. So it, we actually have a fair uh, bit of information on, on veterans in the CLSA. For those people who come to the data collection site, we also do a wide range of physical assessments. And again, this is done in 11 sites across the country. It's all completely standardized. <coughs> we uh, do physical assessments like height and weight and uh, BMI. We have bone mineral density, body composition, and aortic calcification. We have blood pressure, ECG, carotid intimal medial thickness, uh, pulmonary function, both vision and hearing tests, as well as, as performance tests. We also do a neuropsychological battery. And as you can see here, we collect blood and urine as well. Uh, there are 42 aliquots of uh, blood that is stored per participant. Uh, we do some basic hematological tests on site, and those results uh, get recorded. But the remainder is actually processed and frozen within two hours and then get shipped weekly by cryoshipper to uh, the, the biorepository center at McMaster where it's stored, as you can see, in these large liquid nitrogen tanks for future use and analysis. I do want to just give you a little bit of an idea where we are with respect to the first follow-up. To be honest, that's the subject of an entirely uh, separate webinar, but I'll just give you a very brief uh, idea of some of the changes that we made at the first follow-up. So there was a number of new areas of content that we added, and you can see um, in particular we've added an entire module on child maltreatment and also elder abuse, and that was in conjunction with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, there's a number of other things that we've added, things like unmet health care needs, workability. Uh, we've added a question on sexual orientation and gender identity. We've also p asked people about their own subjective sense of cognitive decline. The other thing that we're working on is um, a decedent questionnaire so that when people die, we will um, go to their next of kin and ask them about the last three months of a participant's life. The other major uh, issue with respect to the follow-up that I want to uh, make you aware of is that we have engaged in a number of accommodation strategies. So as you can imagine, 
we had a fairly rigid criteria about who could enter into the CLSA, and so they had to be living in the community at baseline. Um, they had to be able to come to a data collection site if they were in the comprehensive arm of the CLSA. Um, obviously, they had to be um, within the age range, but they also had to be um, uh, cognitively intact in order to sign a consent. As people age within the CLSA, um, we are doing everything that we can within our ability to allow for flexible participation and to be able to accommodate people so that they can stay in the CLSA over the long term. So there's a number of strategies that we've had to employ to address things like people migrating out of the area if they're in the comprehensive side and come to the data collection site. Uh, we've had to deal with cognitive impairment and so we've put a whole process in place around um, getting an indication of participants' wishes for how they would like to participate in the future if they're no longer um, uh, cognitively able to and put in place a, a process for um, getting proxy consent. There are all kinds of accommodations that we've made with respect to physical impairment, and that includes developing a DCS at home visit, um, and also uh, numerous uh, strategies to deal with sensory impairments like hearing loss or vision loss. And the other aspect is that although people had to be living in their own homes when they entered into the CLSA, as they move into institutions, we will do our best to follow them. And there are a number of strategies that we have employed to be able to follow them as they go into institutions as well. What I really want to get into and spend the most time on is um, how to access the data, how to access data and biospecimens. And um, this is, I think, uh, a very timely thing to do because we do have a lot of data now available. The fundamental tenets that we work with in the CLSA, and these are obvious, these are fairly obvious, is that the rights and privacy and consent of participants must be protected and, and respected at all times, that the confidential, confidentiality and security of both data and biospecimens must be safeguarded at all times, and it's also important, particularly for the biospecimens, um, that they're, well, I shouldn't say that. For both the CLSA data and biospecimens, there are resources that we want to be able to use optimally to support research to benefit all Canadians. But the reason I highlighted biospecimens in particular is because um, they're a depletable resource. So we have to be uh, very conscientious about how we uh, utilize those over time. And given that our major objectives in the CLSA are to look at longitudinal aspects, we need to make sure that we uh, have this information over time. Another fundamental tenet is that there is no preferential or exclusive access to the data by anyone, and that includes uh, the PIs, the CLSA team, and uh, as well as our partners and stakeholders. So with respect to who can apply, um, basically researchers who are based in academic settings and research institutes in Canada are eligible to apply. International researchers may collaborate with Canadian researchers in order to access data or biospecimens as long as the data or biospecimens are analyzed in Canada. And you can see that I put an asterisk there and said that that, that piece is currently under review. And uh, it is our intent to be able to release the data, certainly the data first, potentially biospecimens, but we have to work through all of the uh, issues that are involved. For the actual alphanumeric data, we suspect that this will be resolved fairly shortly. Um, and also, too, it's, I would like to point out that both graduate students and postdoctoral fellows based at Canadian institutions are eligible to apply for the data. Uh, graduate students have to apply under um, their supervisor, but postdoctoral fellows can apply on their own. So the data that are currently available, um, there there are, in total, 51,338 participants in the CLSA. 
uh, and baseline data from these participants is available to the research community this spring. So that includes all of the baseline questionnaire data, as well as the majority of physical assessment data and hematological biomarker data from 30,000 plus participants who came to the data collection sites. And I'll be very specific as we go through as to what data is available, but also to you will be able to uh, go onto the website and see what's available. So there are a number of elements, and I separate them out like this for you because they're also separated out in the database on the website, so I just thought it would make it a little bit easier for you to figure out. So there are 60-minute telephone interviews that were done with the 21,241 tracking participants. And you can see here all of the questionnaire modules that are, are contained in that 60-minute telephone interview. Uh, there are also in-home face-to-face interviews that were done by 30,097 comprehensive participants. So we went into the home and collected this information. You'll see that there's a lot of overlap with the previous set of information. So in fact, it's available on all 50,000, but it's separated by database at the moment. Uh, you can see here, this is the data that's currently available for people who are comprehensive participants and came to the data collection site. And the list is slightly different than the earlier list that I showed you. Uh, there are some aspects of uh, the data collection site visits that will not be available for release right away. But you can see that in terms of physical assessment, there is height, weight, waist hip ratio, blood pressure, ECG, spirometry, hearing, four meter walk, timed up and go, standing balance, chair rise, visual acuity, tonometry, and grip strength data available. And this is all data that's available as alphanumeric data. There are no uh, raw images that are being released at the present time. <laughs> You can see in terms of bio biomarkers that we have uh, hematolo hematology variables, and uh, I'll show you those in a sec. Uh, some of the, there are also questionnaire-based information that comes from the data collection site visit. So there's information on social networks, social support availability, social participation, uh, as well as disease symptoms and contraindications for some of the tests. Uh, and those contraindications will, are also useful variables. Uh, the neuropsych assessments have not yet been released for the comprehensive, but they will be released very shortly. Uh, they should be released by the fall. And so if you are thinking about putting in a data application, it is um, uh, possible to request the, the neuropsych assessments as well. They're not currently available on the checklist, but you can add them in the comment section. Um, I've just listed the four tests here that are also available in uh, the, the tracking component, but there is, is, in fact, a larger list of neuropsych assessments that will be released this fall. And here you can just see a list of the hematological data that's available on comprehensive participants. So white blood cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, red blood cells, hematocrit, uh, platelets, a, a number of factors that may be of interest to you. And again, this is all as alphanumeric data. Now, as I said earlier, in, in the baseline, we went back and did a maintaining contact interview where we also took or, or got 30 minutes worth of information from participants as well. And it's both the, the first set of data and this 30-minute interview that comprises the entire set of baseline data. And so this was done on all 51,000 plus participants. Um, and you can see here that there's some information that's very essential to you as you might want to analyze the earlier data set. So things like uh, physical activity or uh, built environment or wealth or oral health, a, a number of variables that will be very key. So this just summarizes um, 
the data by data set. And again, I show it to you in this way because this is the way that you can search it on the website. So there's the tracking baseline 60-minute telephone interview and the baseline tracking maintaining contact interview. There is also the comprehensive baseline in-home interview and data collection site visit and the comprehensive maintaining contact questionnaire. I want to spend some time now just going over how you would actually uh, apply for data access. And this is all on the web, but it's, um, I, I think it's useful to review it and hopefully it will be helpful to you. Um, there's a large amount of information on the website and I would encourage you to spend as much time as you can going through it. But hopefully I'll give you enough of an orientation now that it'll be a lot easier when you do it. So the first thing that you should do really when you're uh, preparing an application is to consult the data and sample access policy and guiding principle because you really do want to be aware uh, right at the outset what can and can't be done with this data. Um, you will also want to review pertinent sections of the CLSA protocol and also look at the CLSA questionnaires. And again, you know, there's such a large volume of data available. It can be quite overwhelming. Um, and so I do encourage you to spend some time with it because I think it will help you uh, orient yourself a lot more when it comes to uh, actually preparing the application. The other thing that you can do is visit the data preview portal. And that's also on our website. Um, and what it does is it allows you to search databases directly. So I'll go through this in a minute with you, but um, it's very, very useful because you can see exactly uh, what's in there and how it's completed. So if you want to know how many people in the CLSA uh, report that they have sleep problems, for example, or report that they have cardiovascular disease, or report that they have some chronic disease, um, or you want to look at um, education level. You can go in and see exactly uh, what proportion of CLSA participants have reported, um, have responded to these, how they've responded to these questions. But really the first actual step is to complete the data and or biospecimen request application. And I will show you that again in a sec. Uh, just as a note up front, um, we will not share identifiable information. And so that includes six-digit postal codes, names, and contact information. Any data that you will get will have an ID and all of the rest of the information, but you will never be able to directly access participants themselves. And I'll just give you uh, the websites up front. If you have queries, you about the alphanumeric data specifically, you should send them to access at clsa-elcd.ca. And if you have queries related to the biospecimens, and in this case I'm referring to the raw biospecimens, uh, you should send them to bbc at clsa-elcd.ca. So this is the front page of our website. and. Um, Again, I would encourage you to spend some time on it. I think that um, there are two bars, as you can see, the bars that up on the bar at the top that have been circled, uh, the researchers bar and the data access bar that will be the most useful to you as you're preparing an application. So the very first thing that you want to do is review the application process. So you can see that under data access, the data access bar, there is a bar that says data application process and then also data application documents. And so I would probably start here. Um, you can see that I've also circled the link to the data and sample access policy and guiding principles. And again, uh, I would encourage you to, to start there. There are two specific data application documents that you need to complete. 
Um, one is the actual application, and I've just put the front page of that application on uh, for you here. The other is the data checklist, and again, I've just put the front page of it on for you here so that you can have an idea of what it actually looks like. These are on the website. They're downloadable forms, <coughs> and they're both required uh, for your application. So, again, um, one of the first things that I would suggest that you do is actually go and look at the protocols. So if you go under the researcher's bar, you'll see that the protocols are right on the website. Uh, there's a shortened version, which is the executive summary, and then there's the full study design um, at baseline. And again, you know, you don't have to read the entire protocol, but you can search the protocol for the sections that are, are most relevant to you. I would also encourage you to use the data collection tools. And I think it's really important to use the data collection tools in conjunction with the data preview portal. Um, and so the data preview portal is really good, but it can it can be confusing. And if you see how the data is actually collected by questionnaire, I think it will be a lot easier for you. The interesting thing is, or the, or the helpful thing, is that you can actually download the questionnaires. And not only can you download them, but you can actually search them uh, for any terms that you're interested in. So, you know, you can search the entire um, questionnaire for, you know, nutrition or food or, uh, poverty, um, and you will get variables come up throughout the data set. But you can see it in the format that it's asked of the participant. Then I would suggest that you go actually into the data preview portal. And again, this is under data access. And the data preview portal really is the gateway to access the data. And it has a variable search mechanism that allows you to um, search and get simple descriptive statistics. You won't be able to do anything complex, but it really is very useful um, to see what the data looks like. Uh, it's currently only available for the alphanumeric data. So once you get into this, once you get into the data preview portal, you want to click on data sets and it will take you uh, into the data preview portal. And I'm just going to give you a couple of tips now. I don't want to pretend like I'm the expert in the data preview portal. And if I thought I was an expert before, we just moved to, the, to a new version um, of the data preview portal on Friday, and I'm still learning my way around. But it's still an extremely useful uh, tool, and I would encourage you to spend some time with it. Um, it's, it's, it's on a backbone called Mika, and uh, Maelstrom has uh, developed this for us, and it is used by a number of cohorts internationally around the world, and it allows all of the cohorts to um, record their data or uh, have a database that's in a similar format. So it, sometimes it doesn't seem particularly useful to us in that it doesn't mirror the questionnaire exactly, but the nice thing about it is is that when we uh, use it across data sets, it will be very, very helpful to us. So this is just the front page here, and you can see that um, there is a variable search tool, and it really is, um, we use it to locate items that we're interested in. We also have um, a link for variables not yet available. And I will just go through it quickly, but you can see that primarily the data that is not, the variables that are not available to you yet are labor force variables and medication variables that have to be coded. These are open-ended text. There are other uh, labor force variables and medication variables in the available data set, but not specifically uh, these ones. But you can look through this. Uh, first, because it's much smaller. If you then go into the variable search, 
you can see that you can get a fair bit of information. So I just point out that there are some smart tips for you uh, to get you started right at the very beginning. But this is what the preview, the data preview portal looks like. So you can see that there are, uh, so you can see that right now uh, we've got the comprehensive maintaining contact questionnaire, the comprehensive questionnaire, the tracking maintaining contact questionnaire, and the tracking main questionnaire. So that's all of the questionnaires are up there, and you can see that there's 5,197 variables. And all of those variable names are currently, will currently be listed. So there's the variable name, the variable label, and you can see which data set it comes from. If you now click on data set over on the left hand side, and uh, I think you do have to actually click on data properties and then acronym as well to bring down the box that shows you which data sets are available. So there's the four data sets, as I said, uh, the comprehensive maintaining contact questionnaire, the comprehensive main questionnaire, the tracking maintaining contact, contact questionnaire, and the tracking main questionnaire. And you can click on or off of those boxes as you like. And you can see here that just the comprehensive data sets are clicked. And so then just the comprehensive data collection, uh, da comprehensive data shows up. And you can see now that there are uh, 3,362 variables. And under data set, all of them come from the comprehensive. In terms of searching, there are a number of ways that you can do it. So again, we're under the variable tab on the left-hand side. And you can see at the top, you can either use the search bar. And the search bar gives you areas of information or scales. You can use the search fields on the left-hand side. And so you can go by a variable label, like food. Or you can go by a, by a variable name. So if you've gone into the actual questionnaire and you know the variable name, you can just type it right in there. You can also use the drop-down menu on the left-hand side, and that gives you areas of information and also constructs. And again, I would suggest that you play around a little bit because it can be uh, a little bit hard to uh, not figure out, but to really fully understand. So for example, let's say um, we can see here that we've typed in depression. And it will give us areas of information. So when we type in depression, areas of information come up. And you can see that we've got the CESD scale and also a scale for psychological distress and emotions. Um, the areas of information really just group together variables that are around a common theme. So these ones are scales, but they can also be categorized around a common theme. But in order to pick it up, it has to be coded. And not every single thing gets coded into an area of information. So just to be aware of that and, and utilize different um, mechanisms. Uh, you can see here, this is searching by variable name. So now under name, we've just typed in DEP. Um, and what, we, what will come up is, for example, variables that come from the CESD depression scale. You can see that there. And again, this time, we'll only get 12 variables coming up. We can also search by variable labels. The thing about going with variable labels is that, again, these have to be coded. And you're not likely to get an exhaustive list. So here, under the label depression, you can see, again, there was a label match for NIH2 variables. Uh, I just want to highlight quickly that you can use an AND OR function. And so this will allow you to search, for example, uh, we've used depression here. And 
what it what happens is if you enter it as an area of interest and also a variable label, then and you put it and you're going to see that you only get one variable that comes out. And so it's both identified as a variable of interest and a variable label. If on the other hand that you do it by or, you can see that you'll get much more uh, uh, variables. So this time they either have to have the label depression or they're part of the psychological distress, distress and emotion area of interest. And in this case you'll get 100 and 20 variables being reported back to you. And you can see over on the right hand side that by using the advanced basic link here, you can switch how that operator works. Um, and lastly, once we get here, you can see that we get some actual uh, descriptive statistics. And you can see at the top, and I apologize, I know it's not all of that all that clear, but you can see that it puts, gives the question for you. So we typed in depression and what came out is uh, from the comprehensive database, has a doctor ever told you that you suffer from clinical depression? And you can see below under statistics that 16.4% of comprehensive participants responded yes to that question. And so this can be very, very useful information to you as you're planning your uh, your study. I know this has been very, very quick and very, very brief, but um, I hope it's been useful. If you do have more information under the data access bar, there is an FAQ uh, section which goes through a lot of this information and should be very useful to you. Uh, I do want to just go through the data access feeds with you. We operate on a partial cost recovery model. Um, it's $3,000 for a straightforward alphanumeric data set, and that's for all 51,338 participants. Um, if you require more complex customization, then there are additional fees. There are no costs, there is no cost to graduate students who use the CLSA da data for their master's thesis or their PhD thesis and uh, postdoctoral fellows are eligible to apply for one free data set. And it is our intention that if you use the data and you derive variables that would be useful to others, that we'll then return those derived variables to the CLSA data set as appropriate. This just gives you an idea of the process of once you, once you submit an application. So you would, when you first submit an application, it goes through an administrative review at the National Coordinating Center. That's just to make sure that the application is all completely filled out. And it also goes for a quick statistical review at the Statistical Analysis Center. And again, that's to make sure that the variables that you've requested we actually have and that kind of thing. It then gets sent to the Data and Sample Access Committee. And the Data and Sample Access Committee review the application um, and make a recommendation to the scientific management team. The Data and Sample Access Committee does not do a full scientific review on applications if they have already undergone scientific review. If they haven't, then they will do that uh, for you. Once that happens, and uh, your application has been approved, then we require a data and sample access agreement to be signed. The data and sample access agreement is, a, is something that is signed between your institution and McMaster as the host institution. And that's the only part of this equation that we have no control over. Um, it may take a little bit of time to get the agreement signed between the two institutions. Once we have that signed and we have proof that you have ethics, um, then uh, the request goes to the Statistical Analysis Center to prepare your data set and deliver it to you. And that process is relatively quick. It's usually done within, uh, I think it's seven to ten working days. And then once you have the data, you are available to utilize that data on your desktop. You have to be aware of the, um, the access agreement that you sign. Uh, 
and there are very strict guidelines about how you can use that data. It has to be in a, a locked room and a secure location. So just make sure that you understand the requirements very strongly. Uh, and then at one year, we will ask you for um, either an annual report or uh, a final report. I do want to highlight to you that there is a funding opportunity to analyze the data set uh, currently available. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research has, in, has uh, uh, a catalyst grant available to researchers at the moment. Uh, in total, there is $1,205,000 available to fund up to 17 grants. Uh, the grants can be $70,000 for up to one year, and it's for alphanumeric data only. And um, I just wanted to, the, the application is on ResearchNet, but I just want to make you aware that it does include a CLSA data request, data access request application as well. Uh, we also, the next, you can also apply just directly to the CLSA to uh, use the data. Um, and the next, uh, the, the next deadline for applications, I believe, is October the 17th. Uh, I just want to remind you of uh, my co-conspirators in crime, Tina Wilson and Parminder Reyna. And uh, obviously, the CLSA cannot be done without a huge contribution from numerous, numerous people. Uh, these are the Operations Committee and the Scientific Leads. And uh, any time you put a list up with people's names, you know that you run the risk of not mentioning somebody really important. Uh, but these are the PIs, the site investigators, the working group leads, and key co-investigators. Uh, we have a large number of CLSA funders and partners. And of course, we could not do this study without our participants. So thank you. Um, I understand from Mark there's a number of questions. So uh, I hope this was useful, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. So yes, there are some questions. I think some of them uh, we can answer uh, fairly quickly. So uh, let's start going through them. Uh, first question from uh, Wasem. Is medication use coded using drug identification number or other coding system? Uh, you can feel free to answer some of these too, Mark. Uh, if you, sure. It's coded sure. using drug identification number. Great. Um, and there's another question. Will the webinar be made available? Yes, we'll have a slide on that shortly, so stay tuned. Um, when will data from the first follow-up be available? Good question. We won't finish collecting data until uh, mid-2018. So um, I would say that at the very earliest, it would be late 2018, early 2019. Great. Uh, what were the baseline exclusion criteria? So off the top of my head, you have to be in the uh, living in the 10 provinces, uh, individuals who were on reserves or crown lands or in the Canadian Armed Forces were also excluded. Um, Susan, any others that I didn't remember? Uh, you had to be living in the community at baseline and you had to be um, not cognitively impaired. And That's right. Those are two important okay. ones community dwelling, and not cognitively impaired. Uh, are the data going to be accessed through data research centers? I think that this question came early on in the presentation, and um, you already answered that, so you apply directly to CLSA. There is some talk about um, putting some data in the data research centers. Um, we haven't been uh, we have, we are in conversation as to whether we will do this, but one of the things that we wanted to do was make the data more accessible to everyone, and that's why we've gone this route directly, which isn't to say we can't use the data um, research centers as well, but it requires some working out. 
Great. Another question. Can Please. you provide a brief overview of the short diet questionnaire from the comprehensive component? Uh, no. I think it would be much better time spent to look it up in the questionnaire. It's on the website. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just apologizing for saying no. Right. Um, the short diet questionnaire contains, uh, just really briefly, it contains several questions asking about your frequency of consumption of various different foods. Uh, so it could be things like poultry, uh, white meat, uh, red meat, uh, the stuff that you drink. Uh, it's a very intensive questionnaire off the top of my head. Uh, I can't uh, identify all of the various food groups that it asks about. But it's very comprehensive. So you're asked, do you consume this particular type of food? And if yes, what is your frequency of consumption? And is that daily, weekly, et cetera? But yeah, the questionnaire is available um, in the data preview portal for viewing. So you can go to it. And Susan has um, already uh, provided information on how to access that information. Um, are there any differences in questionnaire contents between telephone interview and in-home interview, or are the contents similar? And I think I can answer that very quickly to say that uh, there is overlapping content. So everything that we ask in the telephone interview questionnaire is also asked at the in-home interview. But there are some additional questions in the in-home interview or of participants who go to the data collection site. So for example, um, everyone is getting uh, the Ray mental alternation test and animal naming test. Those are cognitive tests. But people who are in the comprehensive component are getting additional cognitive uh, questions. So uh, I think uh, unless, Susan, you have something to add to my answer, the best way to understand what the differences are is to go to the data preview portal to see them, the questionnaires which are available. Yeah. And I, I would, like, the data, I would go to the actual questionnaire because you can download the questionnaire, you can search by the questionnaire. Once you're familiar with the questionnaire, then it's good to go to the data preview portal. It's hard to go to the data preview portal right away um, because it doesn't run through the questions in the way the questionnaire does, necessarily. Yes, that's right. I keep thinking data preview portal because I'm on it a lot myself. But no, you can download the actual questionnaires and that would be a great starting point. Uh, it appears serial biospecimens will be collected every three years. Yes, and I guess, right. Susan, we could confirm that that's the case. Um, participants in the comprehensive component will visit the data collection site every three years, and if they have consented to the um, donation of biospecimens, they will give a blood or a urine sample every three years. Yes, they will. Um, we don't, won't always process it in exactly the same way all the time because, for example, there's some genetic pieces that we don't need to keep doing over and over again, but there are other things like metabolomics or epigenetics or the, the hematological markers that we do want to have um, repeated. Is there a special procedure to request for linkage with administrative data such as hospitalizations and deaths? It's a very good question. Um, at the moment, we're working very closely to try and uh, create linkages with administrative data so that it becomes, so that you become able to request the administrative data and the CLSA data at the same time. Uh, we're working closely with CAIHI. We also have relationships with all of the provinces. We don't have it uh, worked out completely yet. Um, at the moment, and specifically for um, the call by CIHR, you can only request alphanumeric data, the alphanumeric data that's available. There is no opportunity to link to administrative databases through that call. 
Um, but uh, if you would like to link within province to an administrative database, what I would suggest is that you get in touch with us um, either through the access or the info line. Great. Okay, so um, will the CIHR CLSA Catalyst grant support access to biospecimens? The answer is no. It is only for alphanumeric. That is questionnaire-based data. Uh, let's see. How long will it take for the application process? Uh, I guess that's uh, the data access application process. Susan, would you know what the average time frame is from submission of a request to uh, getting an answer? Um, it, it's very hard to say definitively. If I had to give an average, I would say about three months from the time that you submit your application to the time that you get your data. So you can see that um, it goes for the administrative and statistical review pretty much right away. But then there's a little bit of a, a time lag as the data and sample access committee reviews the applications, then they actually meet then there's a turnaround time when they have to make the recommendations that goes to the scientific management team. That whole process takes about six weeks. But where it gets hung up and where we can't guarantee the time frame is around signing the data and sample access agreement. And that, I, I mean, if I could give anybody any bit of advice, that's the place where you have to be completely on top of things because it can fall through the cracks between institutions. You know, McMaster's really good because they're used to doing these all the time. But your own institution may not be, and you need to be really engaged in that process. Um, again, once that's signed, it's a very short period of time before the data set can be prepared for you and released to you. Great. Um, does the project require approval from CLSA before it can be submitted to the CIHR funding call? And I believe the answer is no. You don't need prior approval to apply to CIHR in August for the catalyst. Is that correct, Susan? Okay. Um, here's a comment. Someone has received this data earlier. Um, do we automatically get, this is an individual, they've gotten uh, data from the telephone sample. Do we automatically get the rest of the data from the in-person group as well? And I would imagine the answer is no. You would have to submit uh, a follow-up data access application. Is that correct? Yes, you would. Okay. Um, so Andrew Wister, one of our um, uh, local principal investigators from British Columbia, he's asking, uh, he says, is there a glitch in the search function in the data preview portal? And then he talks about some issues that he had. So um, we'll have to look into that. Um, I would just, let me just say for a sec that for those of you who are used to using the data preview portal, we did upgrade it on Friday so that it's a newer version. It's actually easier to use, but it's different than it was before, slightly different. So some of you may have, um, you may just have to adjust to getting used to it, but as far as I'm aware, there's no glitch. I've been using it a lot this morning and it seems fine. Okay, um, aside from the list of tests provided today, for the biospecimens, is there a full list of tests you intend to conduct in the future, or does this depend on requests from potential investigators? So that's probably referring to um, analyzing of the biospecimens, that question. Well, I don't really know how to answer that. So there is um, a full list of all of the tests, the physical assessment tests, that get done and the hematological analyses that get done and they're on the website. Um, there are, are large, so there are also a number of um, analyses that we're going to be doing and got funding for to do as part of the first follow-up. Um, so we will be doing um, some genetic 
tests. We will be doing some epigenetic analysis. We'll be doing some metabolomic analysis. Those will not be available until 2018. Great, thanks. Uh, when will the titles or topics of approved projects be released to researchers who have... Uh, I lost my place here. Uh, sorry. Uh, will be released to researchers who have made a primary application. So all of the topics of approved projects are posted uh, online and uh, you can go there and see them. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Susan, but they are available online. Yeah, no, there's, um, there are a number of projects that were submitted for the, I think it was the March deadline that will be, uh, the results will be conveyed to uh, applicants very, very shortly. And then there are a number of applications that came in for the June uh, deadline and they will be reviewed. Or they have, well, I'm getting confused now. Uh, yeah, they will be released to, the results will be released to uh, investigators shortly. Great. Great. Is, there, is there a variable to examine rural versus urban? There isn't currently a variable for rural versus urban. Um, and it is possible to generate it, but um, we actually don't release the full postal code. If someone is interested in categorizing that, we can, well, actually, I believe that we have started to do some work on that. Um, I actually have to respond to that individual person myself, unless you know the answer right now, Mark. Um, well, I can tell you what I did. Um, I was uh, given access to the first three digits of the postal code and using that information uh, you can uh, categorize urban rural but that's based on Canada Post's definition of urban rural. Right. And so upon request uh, we can release the first three digits of postal code but it's not part of the regular data set. Um, and it requires generating itself. And I do believe that some people are doing this. The problem is, as you see, there is, you know, we we can return some of those derived variables to the data set, but people haven't finished analyzing their data yet, and we couldn't add it to till the next wave. So I think people will have to generate it individually until that point. Yeah, and it's fairly easy to do that. Um, you mentioned that drug names were not coded. Um, can we consider submitting a project including drugs to CIHR Catalyst Grant and when will the drug info be available? Uh, I don't know the answer to when the drug information will be available. I know that it's being worked on, but it's very labor intensive. Um, I will get back to that person. And uh, I just got a text from Parminder, Parminder who said that urban and rural uh, is available. Great. So question, um, someone is wondering if the interviews were conducted in English and French only or were participants offered interpretation? And the answer is English or French only. Um, can the impending legalization of cannabis, uh, given that, uh, has there been any thought given to integrating more detailed questions on cannabis use into follow-up? Sorry, can you repeat that, Mark? Um, given the impending legalization of cannabis, has there been any discussion of including more detailed questions on cannabis use in future uh, waves of the study? Um, we have discussed it in the past. It's not currently on the table to be added, but it's certainly worth considering and uh, it's a possibility. How will participant death be captured? Through death certificate matching or some other means? Uh, yes, it will be done uh, using vital statistics, but we often learn of participant deaths by having um, 
family members contact us as well. But it will all be done through linkage with biostatistics. Can data access be expedited in any way for graduate students, especially master's students? Uh, no. It's already a reasonably expedited process. Um, it's no longer than applying for any other uh, uh, data set, I would say. And it's certainly a lot faster than collecting your own data. So unfortunately, uh, that's just it's such an un it's such a process that's required in terms of review that we really only can uh, do it in a regimented fashion like that. Beyond administrative application errors, can an application be rejected based on study design or significance? Our policy is to reject as few applications as possible. Uh, we always make sure that it's either undergone scientific review or we will do a brief scientific review ourselves if it hasn't undergone scientific review. Um, and we always want to make sure that it stays within what our participants consented to. Now, that said, it's really difficult to think of a research question that wouldn't fall within the consent process um, that would be outside of, you know, understanding adult development and aging. So um, on occasion, we will, we will ask a, an applicant to resubmit something if we think that it hasn't been fully articulated, but we rarely reject it completely outright. Great, thanks. So we're at 105. There's a couple of questions left over. Um, we'll have to defer the questions about uh, cannabis to another time. There's a question about REB ethics approval. You'd have to check with your local REB to determine what they require for um, access to secondary data. So I think that um, we're over time, and I'm getting pressure to um, uh, put an end to this webinar. So Susan, this was really informative, I think, especially given the upcoming CIHR Catalyst Grant. Uh, this um, uh, webinar has really helped uh, orient people towards what the CLSA can offer, and it'll be very helpful information with respect to applying for that uh, grant opportunity. The deadline is August 30th for that CIHR Catalyst Grant opportunity. Uh, Susan, on behalf of all of us here, uh, at CLSA, thank you very much for uh, your very informative presentation today. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. And you can see for final reminders, um, there's information on the CIHR funding opportunity at the links that you see pasted there. Um, the presentation slides and webinar recording will be posted to the CLSA website. Uh, you've got the links there. And we'll be back with uh, the seminar series in September 2016, and we will hopefully uh, be having researchers present the results of their projects that have involved the use of CLSA data. So check our visit for websites, and on behalf of everyone at CLSA, thanks for making the webinar series a success, and we'll see you in September.